Uh, so I'm Eric Bernhardson. I just joined as organizer of this meetup. Yep, thank you. Um, we'll get started in a few minutes. Uh, today we have Andreas Muller, who is one of the main authors of Psychic Learn, who a lot of you probably know. Um, but uh, before we get started, I wanted to start with a few announcements. Does, does anyone have any announcements? I think Gary. Hi, I'm Gary Markets. I'm the CEO of Geometric Intelligence. Some of you may have seen an article about us. It was a feature story in Technology Review this month and was circulating online uh, quite a bit recently. Um, uh, I'm a PhD student of Stephen Pinker, a professor at NYU for the last 20 years. I'm going to be speaking here in this very venue in April, um, talking about some of the limits of AI. And the company, Geometric Intelligence, was founded to go beyond deep learning taking inspiration from human cognition to cognitive development. We're interested in sparse data and how to generalize better from it, how to do things efficient from data. We are hiring. Um, and if anybody here has strong coding skills and wants to learn about machine learning or already knows a lot about machine learning, likes doing research, uh, visit our website, geometric.ai, or send us your data at jobs at geometric.ai. Uh, we're definitely hiring. We'd love some help. Thanks a lot. Cool, any other announcements? Anyone who's hiring who wants to broadcast that out? Awesome, sounds like no one. Um, cool, so Andreas is actually, the, I think, the first in a series of four speakers that are all from NYU. Uh, we would love some more speakers. We have a friendly line up right now. We'd love if, if someone who's not from NYU wants to come and talk, maybe me. Um, but let me know if you have any, uh, if, if you're interested in talking. But uh, enough said, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, welcome, Andres. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks, Eric. So I hope everybody can hear me now. So this is a sort of introductory talk, so I hope there's some interesting bits for you in there. Maybe a first question. So who here has uh, used scikit-learn before? All right. Um, who here would say use, uses it like once a week at least? All right, okay, cool. So yeah, so um, slides are online. There's this wonderful, very short URL, nycmlsklearn, and uh, there's some notebooks and the slides. And so I'm gonna walk you through basically the main structure of scikit-learn and how to use it. And then at the end, there's gonna be a bit more like advanced stuff. So for those of you who don't know, scikit-learn is a machine learning library in Python. It's basically a package consisting of a lot of the most commonly used machine learning algorithms, like for classification, regression, clustering, um, all kinds of things, uh, together with uh, tools to do model selection, model evaluation, like grid search, cross-validation, and different metrics. There's also so if you're interested in learning about scikit-learn, we have a uh, large documentation online at scikit-learn.org, particular the user guide and the uh, tutorials and the examples. There's like a whole lot of these, and you can learn a lot from the uh, documentation there. So now let's start from the basics on uh, how to do machine learning with scikit-learn. So obviously everything starts with the data. So the import most important thing is you need to represent your data first uh, to work with scikit-learn. So in scikit-learn, data is assumed uh, most of the time to be just a two-dimensional array of some floating point numbers. So I'll talk a little bit about later what to do if your data is not in this form, but basically for most of the talk, I'll assume you have some data matrix that looks something like this. And um, so in this matrix, each sample corresponds to run one row. So each sample is uh, one of the entities you want to reason about, like uh, one user on your website or something like that. And each feature is one column, so this is like their age or their gender or anything like that. And then you have, uh, particularly in supervised learning, you have some output variable uh, like cl for classification or regression, uh, and we call that Y, and that's the 1D uh, array. And so we use NumPy for all of our data structures. So usually we have X, which is our data, which is a num uh, two-dimensional NumPy array, and Y, which is our desired output, which is a two-dimensional, uh, sorry, which is a one-dimensional NumPy array. And did the mic go off? No. Okay, so, um, and before we can do any machine learning, usually we want to split our data into a training and a test set. So we take a, a part of our data set, um, 
of our data and of our labels and label it as a training set. We use this to build our model and the remainder we keep as a test set to test whether the model that we developed will work on data it didn't see before. Of course, if we develop any model before we put it in production, we want to make sure that it actually works well. And that's why we keep a test set separately. Um, yeah, so fortunately there's a one-line function cycle learn train test split that splits your data up into a training and a test part. So once you have your data split up, the basic um, working flow of supervised machine learning is, okay, you take your data, you take your labels, and you build a model from them. Then you can use your model to make predictions on new unseen data, like your test data. And you can also use the model uh, and the predictions uh, to evaluate how well your model does. And this is sort of the basic uh, workflow of any supervised machine learning application. And there's basically two phases, the training part where you build a model and the generalization part where you want to apply your model to new unseen data. The way this works in cycle learns the follows. So all of the models are encapsulated into classes so uh, into Python classes, so let's say we want to learn a classifier and we pick the random forest classifier model. I'm not going to talk about the models because I don't have enough time for that, but okay, let's say we want to use a random forest. So first we instantiate an object of this class uh, and I call it CLF. And this encapsulates the training algorithm as well as everything we learned from the data. To actually build the model, we call the fit method. And we give the fit method the training data x train which is a 2D array that represents the data, the data and uh, the 1D array Y train, which is the desired classification output. If you call this fit method, this builds the random forest model and stores it in the CLF object. Then if we see new data, or X test here, we can call the predict method, and the predict method will apply the model, uh, the random forest model in CLF, and will return some predictions. So this will be the labels that um, sort of the model things should be uh, the output for Y test. And if you want to evaluate your model, you can use the score function. The score function of the CLF object, again, it takes uh, the test data together with the test labels, and it compares the prediction that the model makes against the ground truth. All right, so the workflow pretty easily maps to the API. And I'm just going to walk through a notebook to see um, how this looks like in practice. I'm going to use like a toy data set that ships with scikit-learn, the wonderful uh, digits data set. Okay, who of you knows the digit data set? Okay, then I'll explain it. Um, so this low digit uh, function in scikit-learn returns something like a dictionary and this contains like target, description, data, images, target names. So the imp interesting parts are uh, data, images, and target. So these images are uh, is a NumPy array, 1800 times 8 times 8. So these are 1800 8 times 8 grayscale images of 100 digits. So here's the NumPy array for the first, um, for the first digit. These are like super low resolution 8 times 8. So this image looks something like this. Beautiful. Um, and so um, the task here is to determine, it's a classification task, what is the digit that is in this image? And well, this is a zero. So we have also have the data attribute. The data is just the flattened out images in the format that we need. It's a uh, number of samples times number of features. So each row represents um, one digit and has 64 grayscale values. We also have the targets. For each of the images, we have one target, which is an integer, 0 to 9, which tells us what is the correct answer. Like, what, what is the um, digit depicted in the image? You can see for the first one, it's 0, because the image uh, shows a 0. All right. So this, now we have this very simple classification data set, and we can do some machine learning with this. So first off, we split it into a training and a test set. And um, so now we have these. Uh, two, matri two um, matrices, X train, X test, Y train, Y test. And now we can build our machine learning model. So first we need to import the class of the model. Here I use a linear support vector machine, linear SVC. Then we instantiate an object. This is also when we can set some parameters of the model. Then we call the fit function. The fit function builds the model. The, so that learns the support vector machine from the training data, the training labels 
and stores like the coefficient and everything that's learned in the SVM object. Then I can use the predict function to predict. Here I uh, use it first on the, the training data. And so the first row here is the output on the training data. The second row is the training labels. And you can see, OK, the six ones that we can see, they look the same. You can also use the score function to see actually 99.5% of the predictions made on a training set are correct. However, we're not really interested in what does the model do on the training set. We want to use it on the test set. And um, so here we can see we do 95% correct on a test set, which is not too bad. But the data set is very simple. The cool thing about scikit-learn is that the interface is not only very simple, it's also consistent across all the models. So if we want to say, oh, we don't really like SVMs, we want to uh, random forest instead, we can use exactly the same code, basically. We just have to replace the class name, and then we can uh, train a random forest model. So here, I import a random forest classifier. I create a random forest object, call the fit method, call the score method. Hey, we're a little bit better. And um, the code is exactly the same. And it's really just sort of these three steps to build a machine learning model. OK, a any questions so far? <laughs> the default split between train and test is 25-75, or 75-25. But there's like a train size parameter, so you can change that. Oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me. I'm probably going to go kind of fast over the early bits. All right, so this was sort of the interface to do supervised learning for classification and regression. So regression looks exactly the same way. So the other, oh, sorry. When you change the model, did you have to run the prediction again? Oh, so you don't, so score actually does the predict. So score creates predictions and then compares the predictions against the ground truth. So that's, I can run predict and we'll just return the things. Score runs predict internally. Um, all right. So the other big class of models are unsupervised machine learning models. In particular, I want to talk about unsupervised transformations of the data. So in unsupervised learning, you have your training data, you give it to your model, and you say learn. And that's usually kind of a vague task, what the model is supposed to do. But often the idea is that to um, get a new representation of the data that's maybe more semantic or more meaningful in some way. And then you can use this new representation that the model learned and apply it also to, new des to your test data and get a new view of the data. Um, very classical method for this is uh, PCA, principal component analysis, which tries to find the direction of maximum variance in the data. If you want to apply unsupervised transformation like PCA, uh, again, you start by instantiating your model. Then you fit the model. This time, it only gets the training data. There's no Y, so there's no labels um, because it's an unsupervised model. Sorry. And um, to transform the data, we use the transform method here on the test data set. So before, we use predict to make predictions. Predict is used in classification and regression. Transform is when you want to, a new transformation of the data, like a new representation of your input data. All right. So let's do some PCA. So here I just load my digits data set again. And before we go into PCA, I want to do an even simpler transformation of the data, which is just removing the mean and uh, scaling to uh, unit variance. That's a good pre-processing step for some of the learning algorithms, and it's good to know how that works. So here I import the standard scalar. So this is the class that removes mean and standard deviation. I instantiate the model and fit it using the training data. So X train is, again, is the training portion of my uh, digits data set. So this just estimates the mean and standard deviation. Then I can use the transform method to uh, scale my data. So before, I had like the 75% of the data, like uh, 1,300 points, 64 pixel values. The scaled data, obviously, is the same size. I only changed the scale. But now, the mean is removed, so the mean is 0 of the data. Over hmm? uh, uh, You uh, flattened your data from an 8 by 8 to a 64. Yeah. Do that with the unsupervised? Yes. 
like whenever I do anything, the data is always flattened. Only for the printing, I reshaped it to eight by eight. Oh. So the data is always n uh, number of samples times number of features, always a two-dimensional array. Okay. And you always need to put it into this format. Uh, just coming back, what's the URL of my GitHub? I'm at a Miller, but right. Yeah, a Miller is right, slash, uh, click on repositories, the repository I last pushed to. OK. So yeah. So here, OK, after I scaled, mean is 0. And um, so I do here the mean over all the different samples. And standard deviation over all the different samples is 1 after scaling. Um, it's 0 in some places because some of the pixels have no variance. They're always white. And now I can transform the test data, also using the transform method. What might be slightly surprising is um, that the mean of the test transform test data is not zero. Because what we did is we um, subtracted the mean of the training data and we scaled by the um, inverse standard deviation of the training data. It's important to transform your training and the test data in the same way. So um, we fit on the training data and then we transform both the training and the test data. Why? It was a question why or when? Why? Because the input format for anything in scikit-learn is a two-dimensional NumPy array um, with each row one sample. That's, like, that's the input format for scikit-learn, so that it knows what are samples, what are features. You always need to put your data into this two-dimensional NumPy array. Would it be different if it's supervised? No. No matter unsupervised, supervised, anything you do with scikit-learn, you need to bring your data into format that is like a two-dimensional NumPy array which is like where the shape is number of samples times number of features. That's always what I assume x to be. All right. So yeah. Um, enough scaling of the data. So we can also do principal component analysis. Interface looks exactly the same way. We import PCA. Here I say I want to keep the first two principal components of the data. Don't worry if you don't need, know what that means. Um, I fit the model. And uh, so again, here I just give it a x. I could give it uh, also just the training data. I give it here the whole data set. Um, and then I transform the data. So here you see the shape before was we had 64 grayscale values. Afterwards, we only have uh, two features. These are the two principal components of the data. The reason I went down to two is because then I can plot the data. And I like to do that. So this is a visualization of the digits data set of the 1800 or something digits um, projected down to a two-dimensional space. So PCA itself doesn't know anything about the classes, that there are 10 classes or something. Uh, PCA just sees the data, finds the direction of maximum variance. For the visualization here, I colored the points according to which class they belong to, so the plot is more interesting. All right. Questions? Cool. So just to summarize the um, basic API, so X is always a two-dimensional NumPy array. And uh, if you have targets, they are one-dimensional NumPy array. And you always build the model using the fit method. For supervised models, you give it X and Y, so the data plus some targets. For unsupervised methods, you only give it the data. You use the predict method to make predictions for classification, regression, clustering. So this is basically always when you want something like y out, when you want a one-dimensional vector of responses. And if you want a new representation of your data, use the transform method. That's for pre-processing, dimensionality reduction, feature selection, feature extraction. And sort of these three methods are sort of the core of scikit-learn and like the methods you'll use the most. All right. So now I want to talk a little bit more about um, evaluating models. So what I told you at the beginning was, OK, we have all our data, and we split it up into a training portion and the test portion. We built our model on the training portion. We test it on a test portion. Um, that's kind of the simplest way to do it, but sort of suboptimal. What's oh, Yeah, 
Yes, but it's worse than what I'm going to tell you next, which is do cross validation. Um, I mean, it doesn't really depend on the model. What the split should be it depends more on the data, I guess, or I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, you should do cross validation, really. So the idea behind cross validation is you uh, pick a number, usually five or 10, and you um, split your data into equally sized folds. So I took all my data and I split it into five parts. And now I declare the first part, my test set, and the remaining four parts, my training set. I train on the four, these four parts, test on, one, uh, test on fold one, and I record how well does my model do. So I get some accuracy. Then I do the same with fold two as test set, and so on. This way I get five different values of uh, how well my model does. Now, um, the benefit of doing this is, before I had one value, um, so that I didn't know any uncertainty about this. So if it tell, told me I was 99% correct, I was very happy, but I didn't know if that was like, maybe I was very lucky and only put simple samples in my test set. Now if I have uh, five numbers, I can see, are, they all of, are all five of them 99% or is one 99% and the other one is 10%? Which fold is a fabrication of the data? No, sorry. Each fold, so, each fold is a part of the data. So let's say you have five folds. You split your data into uh, five equally sized parts. They're non-overlapping. Then you say, first fold is my test set. The remaining two, three, and four, five are my training set. You build one model, evaluate it, store the number. Then you say, fold two is my test set, and so on. Um, so you always use different part, subsets of the data to, uh, as training and test set. So the other um, reason why this is good is because now every data points in a test set exactly once. And furthermore, if you use five or 10 folds, you'll have more data to actually train your model on. If you use uh, 10 fold cross validation, you only need to leave out one tenth of your data as test set. You have 90% of your data to train your model. Uh, if you do the standard split, you only have 75% of your data to train each model. Downside of doing cross validation, it takes five or 10 times as long. So, good idea to do. So it's very simple to do cross-validation with scikit-learn. So again, I uh, load my favorite data set, put all the flattened images into X, the targets in Y. Um, cross, uh, evaluating the model with cross-validation is done using the cross -val score function. And the model I want to evaluate here is the linear SVC, so linear support vector machine. And the way to do cross-validation is I call the function. The first param parameter is the model. Then the, the second is the data. The third is the desired outputs. Then I can say how, ma um, how many folds of cross-validation do I want. And here I say five. So what this will do, it will do all these uh, five different splits of the data and give me the five accuracy values. And if I want, I can compute the mean to get some robust estimate of how well the model does. I can use maybe not 510, but 10 here, and I'll get the 10 different results of the cross-validation. So this built 10 different models internally. I can also uh, change the way the model is evaluated. So this, by default, gives me accuracy for classification and R squared for regression. But there's like a lot of different methods I could use. You can use the scoring, uh, the scoring parameter to use um, any other method that I want. For example, here I use the F1 macro score. You can look at the documentation or in this dictionary and you see all the different kinds of way you can evaluate a model. You can also um, change the way that the model, uh, sorry, that the data is split up. So by default, for classification, it uses k-fold stratified cross-validation, which means it splits the data up into like five parts so that the, each part has the same fraction of each class as the original data. So let's say you have two classes, 80% is class A, 20% is class B, then it will split up the data so that each fold has 80% of class A, 20% of class B. That's the default for classification. Um, but you can imagine other strategies, and there's a lot of other strategies in scikit-learn that you can pass as the CV option. One that I show here is uh, shuffle split. 
that just basically takes random portions out of the data and does this um, for how many uh, for many iterations. So here I say, for 10 iterations, take 40% out of the data as test set. And there's many variations. All right. Questions about this? How do you use this information to get a better fit? Or do you not? Yes, so how do you use this information to get a better fit? We'll come to this next. So this is, this is only how to robustly evaluate a model. So now I have, an, have like a number, if I compute a mean of these, to tell me my, your model is x good. Um, yeah, but, but now the next thing is, so wh what do we learn from this? Or how can we improve the model using this? Um, yeah, so I mean, the basic motivation is, I said, so this is the machine learning pipeline, get your model, fit, and predict. But the challenges here, or one of the challenges is that all of the models have a whole lot of parameters that you need to set to get good performance out of the model. And um, so a lot of what machine learning is about is find the right model and find the right parameters of the model. And the most common strategy to find uh, good parameters for models is uh, grid search with cross-validation. So, now I'm going to explain how I like to do grid search with cross-validation. So we start again with our data. We split it into a training and a test part. Then I use the training part to f not only fit the model, but also find good parameters of the model. So I do cross-validation on the training part and use this to find good settings of the parameters. Then once I found good setting of the parameters, I build a new model with these parameters and evaluate on the test set. It seems a bit complicated, but the problem is Let's say I would only use a split of the data in the training test set. And then I try to find the best parameters and the best model using the test set. Problem is, if I, t uh, if I use the test set to find which is model is the best, this, model, this test data is not like unseen data. I already used the information that is in this test data set. And my uh, result will be too optimistic. So ideally, I would only run my model, once I selected which model I want to use, I would only run this model once on the test data set and this will tell me exactly what to expect for future data. As soon as I, basically, as soon as I touch the test data twice, I'm too optimistic in how I will perform on uh, new data. So, and then, so how do I find these parameters? Uh, using cross validation. So, basically, I use grid search. So, I try out one parameter setting for my SVM, and then I try out all the others, and then try more and more and more and wait forever. Um, but that's sort of the best way that most people do it. To try all possible combinations and parameter ranges that uh, you think are good. So, yeah? Is there a way maybe to automate that so it can calibrate itself so it starts zeroing in on the number? <laughs> yeah. So, the, okay, the question was, can you automate this? Uh, the answer is kind of. Um, so there's stuff. And people have been working on using Gaussian processes for hyperparameter optimization. So, I mean, if you have a lot of parameters, sometimes it helps. But then the thing that you want to, uh, that has parameters again. So then you need to optimize these. I mean, can it, can it make a variable I'll show you. Of course, it doesn't work as well. Yeah, but wh why would it be convex? Yeah, there's no reason. I said local. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so pe people like people settled on grid search because it works better than hill climbing. So what's the resolution of grid? That's a good question. That depends on how much time you have. How much compute time? Yeah, how much compute time you have? Yeah. Um, and, and there's alternatives, but this, is, this works very well for most of the cases. If you have a lot of parameters, you're, uh, you have pr run into problems, and people are actively working on improving this. There's cool stuff which is called meta-learning, where you try to predict what's the right parameter setting for the data set. Um, but I don't have time to talk about this today. Um, so, but now, now let's, let's do the simple grid search first. So I start with my uh, digits data set, I split it into a training and a test part. So now I need to, and um, let, let's say I have this um, kernel SVM and I want to set the parameters for a kernel SVM. And because I read the documentation, I know the two important parameters are C and gamma. So, so 
I can define search ranges using a dictionary. It's called the parameter grid, where the keys are the parameters I want to search over, and the values are the, all the different values I want to try out. So here, this is what this uh, dictionary looks like. So I have like an exponential grid over values for gamma and over values for C. So these are all the gamma values I want to try, and these are all the C values I want to try. And sort of what the ranges are and how they should be scaled is sort of arcane knowledge at this point. We try to make this more automatic, but it's very hard to know what good ranges are that work for many data sets. But there's some help in the documentation, and yeah, people are working on making this more automatic. Um, but let's say we have this from the documentation. We know these are good ranges. So this parameter grid defines the range we want to search over. Now we can instantiate the grid search CV object. This object um, does all the grid search for us. It gets the model we want to uh, set the parameters for, which is here the SVC, the kernelized support vector machine, and the parameter grid. And here I tell it to be verbose so we can see what's happening, and I tell it to do five-fold cross-validation. Yeah. Based on the data set, right? Well, we didn't do the grid search yet. Okay. <laughs> so this, um, so this gives me a grid search object. This grid search object is what we call a meta estimator because it takes this model. This is just a support vector machine, and it builds a thing that looks exactly like the uh, SVC did. It has like a fit, fit and a predict and a score, so it looks just like a classifier. Only does something more smart behind the scenes. So if we call fit here on the training data, what it'll do is it will run cross-validation for each combination of the parameters seen gamma. So here you can see it did the first value of uh, gamma and the first value of C, and um, this gives you, gives you one score. It does this five times because we do five-fold cross-validation. So these are for five different splits of the data set. Then it takes the second value of gamma, does five, uh, the five splits, and so on. And so it tries all possible combinations. And does this on a training set. And once it finished, sorry, once it finished this, it fi uh, finds the best parameter setting based on the um, cross-validation scores. And then it trains the model again on the whole training set with the, with the best parameters it found. And then it stores this model. And if I call predict now, it will use the model trained on the whole training set with the best setting of the parameters. And I can call score. And score, again, will now use the best setting of the parameters trained on the whole training set. Will each iteration, like for any combination of the will do all five? Yes. For each uh, combination of the parameters, it will run the whole cross-validation, like five times, as I said, five times. Oh, what's interesting, so if you uh, have many cores and you have little time, you can do n jobs equal to a number, and it'll use parallel, uh, many cores in parallel, as many as you specify here. So that's always good to know. Um, so here, you basically, you didn't actually need to know which are the right parameters that it found. Um, you can just use the model. If you care for some reason what parameter were found, you can look at the best params attribute, which will tell you c equal to 1 and gamma equal to 0 0.001 were the best, whatever that means. It's also good um, to maybe look into what happened in a grid search. The grid search has this grid scores attribute, which stores all the results. And I'm going to visualize this here in a heat map. So these are the results of the cross-validation. Can you see something? Maybe you can see something. And so here's the average cross-validation accuracy um, for different values of gamma and different values of C. And so this uh, kind of yellow, bright yellow means in the high 90s, and this dark blue, purple, means around 10%. So, yeah? You see, I the iPython notebooks available somewhere? Yeah, the URL that I, I will show the URL in the end again. Okay, thanks. Everything is available. Um, or you can go on my GitHub account and find them there. Um, so the thing that I uh, want to look at here is 
if the parameter I found is somewhere at the edge, I probably needed to expand my search range. So actually, uh, I think the optimum is here. So we're pretty good. If there was like a gradient towards the side or there was n nothing good anywhere, then probably had a wrong search range. The other thing that's interesting is here for the kernel SVM, there's this kind of narrow range where it's in the high 90s, so it's very good. And then there's a lot of the space where it's 10%, so chance performance. So there's a very crazy drop off in performance. So this is very, uh, not very robust to the parameter settings. It's the This is for possible settings of gamma and C. So for each possible setting of so if I set gamma to 0 0.1 and C to 100, then I run cross validation of um, using this parameter settings on the training set, I get uh, the average of the cross validation performance is 10%. Uh, So uh, before when I ran cross-validation, I think uh, I, I, uh, I ran it with a linear SCC, so I used a different model and didn't set the parameters. So so how to space the parameters is like an interesting question, and it's also arcane knowledge, I would say. And for regularization in uh, linear models and uh, kernel SVMs, I would always do like a logarithmic or like exponential scale. So if for C, gamma, and alpha, do that. If you, you are using like, if you do number of features in a random forest, I wouldn't do that. Um, I mean, this is kind of what this map shows here, right? If I go from this parameter set to this parameter setting, it dro drops from 90% correct to 10% correct. So that's pretty drastic. Um, OK. I think I want to move on. Actually, where, when did we start, by the way? I want to check the time. Uh, you've got another hmm? Sorry? OK. Yeah, but I, I have like a lot more. So, sorry. There was a question somewhere? Yes. Uh, sometimes, like, something that, like, number of estimators that tell the yeah. more the better. Yes. So uh, we, we try to make a table what to optimize, and also a dictionary what to optimize with the good default values. We have none of yet. Also, I'll tell you later to read my book. Um, then uh. where there will also be a list. This param grid, I mean, this, uh, the one that I defined here, this is particular for, I mean, actually, this is like, uh, I cheated here. So the default that I would use is this. Um, but th this is for parameter C and gamma for the SVM. So this only works for the kernel SVM with RBF kernel. Yes. <laughs> Question was, is it feasible for large data sets? Answer is yes. Um, get more machines. This is uh, embarrassingly parallel over. So if you can run one on one machine, you can run 10 of these in 10 machines. And you can just spin up more. Um, OK, maybe one more question, and I'm going to move on. I mean, this is a logarithmic grid. So these changes in the parameters are very drastic. And this is very typical for RBF SVMs. So I mean, it's, it's not, you should be happy that you tuned the right parameters. Um, and, but this is like, it always looks like this for RBF SVMs. For trees, it's not as bad. Um, but this is like typical, and I wouldn't be too worried. And also, like, I mean, each, each, each block means changing the parameter by a factor of 10. OK, but I'm going to move on now, because otherwise, I'm never going to get anywhere. I I'll be around. You can bug me later. Um, all right. Yeah. 
Yeah, kernel is RBF. Default kernel is RBF. That's why there's, there's a gamma parameter. Um, OK, so first hurdle, you need, if we do machine learning, we need to set all the parameters. That's annoying. Second hurdle is usually you don't just get your data and your labels and build a model. Usually there's like a lot of processing in between, like doing feature extraction, which is often very manual and annoying. It's like one of the biggest parts of machine learning, rescaling your data, doing feature selection, and so on. And a very common mistake is that the mistake is that people, if they do model selection, grid search, model evaluation, they only do it on the last part, the last step of the pipeline. That's a really bad idea, because um, if you do cross-validation to evaluate your model, tr uh, trying to find out how well it's generalized, if you adjust parameters in this way, you leak information of your test faults into in in the feature extraction, the scaling, and the feature selection. And uh, your estimates of how well your model performs will be uh, too optimistic. So what you really need to do is to run cross-validation and model comparison over the whole pipeline of your models, over the whole process of uh, from going from the raw data to the finished model. And so there's a cool tool to do this in scikit-learn, which is called pipelines, which I'm going to explain a little bit. So what pipelines do are basically they chain a couple of transformers with some final model, usually like a classifier or regressor. So here, let's say we have a pipeline that is two transformers. So I want to do a PCA, then I want to scale my data, and then I have run my classifier. And um, so what this pipeline object does, so it builds this, yeah, this pipe of these two transformations and a classifier. And I, if I call fit, what it will do, it'll take the data, go to the first transformer, call fit with the data and the labels. Then you this build the first transform model. Then you call transform, you get a new representation of your training data called x1. Use the new representation, sorry, x1 to fit the second step in the pipeline. This will build this model t t2. Like let's say t1 was my PCA, t2 is my scalar. Um, now I can use this to transform the x1 to x2. I have the new representation of the data, and I use this to fit my classifier. So again, with the labels and the new representation. And this is sort of, th th these steps is everything that happens if you call pipe.fit. If you call pipe.predict, it takes your uh, test data and just transforms your test data um, with the first transformer, gives you like x prime one, transforms this with the second transformer, gives you x prime two, and then this is fed into the classifier um, using a uh, predict method. And then you get a prediction. And because having this chaining of operations is so common, this is a, like a very powerful tool. Oops. So let's see how this works. I use my wonderful digits data set. So here I just have one, uh, two steps in the pipeline. I just scale my data, and uh, then I build a support vector machine. So this is the steps that I would usually do to scale the data. So here I get the standard scalar. I fit the standard scalars, so I have the mean and variance of my da training data. I transform it, the training data, to get train scaled. I build a support vector, I get instantiate the support vector machine, and I fit it with the uh, scaled training data. So that would be the fit for this pipeline. Um, to make a prediction, I take the scalar, transform the test set, get x test scaled, and then I can uh, call the score method, for example, if I want to know how, how well it does. I should run these cells. All right. So, but pipelines help you to just make this much more compact. So here, I use make pipeline from the pipeline module to build a pipeline out of the standard scalar and the SVC. And you can have as many steps as you want. The only requirement is that all but the last step need to be transformers. Then I call fit. So th this line here does the same as this cell. So the thing that I had on my slide, it calls fit on the uh, standard scalar, transforms the data, and calls fit on the SVC with the transform data. And if I call score, it will transform the test data set and give the tra uh, transform data to the SVC. And uh, 
the pipeline will have all the methods that the last step has. The last step here, the SVC is the classifier, so the pipeline will have score and predict methods. OK. Questions about this? No. Well, they, they all, what do you mean by parameter? OK. Yes. It's very easy to use transform method you wrote yourself, and a lot of people are doing this. Basically, they need to have a fit method and a transform method. You need to write a class that has a fit and a transform method, and then you can use that. And I highly encourage that. Um, all right. So, so this is cool because it makes your code shorter and uh, therefore le uh, less buggy. But the real cool part is that you can now use this pipeline in cross-validation. So before, like doing cross-validation over your whole pipeline was how, basically you needed to write it yourself. You couldn't use scikit-learn. But now you can because now we have a single model pipeline that has the pre-processing and the uh, model building step in it. And so it can just call cross fault score in this pipeline and will, for each split in the cross-validation, it will um, build, uh, it will estimate mean and uh, standard deviation, scale the data, scale the test data, uh, train the model, and evaluate on a test set. So we'll do all these steps for each of the splits. And so that's kind of cool. So this is like doing uh, cross-validation the proper way with um, pre-processing. And you can go one step further. You can also do grid searches with a pipeline. So here, uh, I define my parameter grid. And I define a grid search as I did before. Only now I give it the pipeline object. Um, you need to adjust the grid, parameter grid a little bit. Because you need to say, which step in the pipeline do you want to uh, change the parameters? So there's two steps in the pipeline, the standard scalar and the SVM. And um, there might be like many, and many of them might have parameters. You can grid search over parameters over any step in the pipeline. And um, the way you specify the parameters is you give the lowercase class name, two underscores, and then the parameter, uh, then the name of the parameter. So here I say, in the step that's the SVC class, adjust the parameter C and adjust the parameter gamma. And the rest is the same. Then I call fit, and it does, for each uh, step in the grid search, and for each cross-validation, it builds all steps of the pipeline. Okay. Qu questions about that? There's a fit transform function that does fit and transform at the same time. So I could have saved one line somewhere up there. Yes. <laughs> Um, yes. Oh, well, pipeline doesn't have n jobs, but grid search has n jobs, so you can give. Yes, but then the, the stacking model is also a transformer. So if we have a voting classifier, which basically does that, and it has a transform method, so it acts as a transformer. So it just stacks the probability outputs of all the models. Do you have an example of that? No. There's an example on the website. Um, OK. Cool. Yeah, so do cross-validation and parameter section over all steps jointly. Keep a t separate test set until the very end. Use it only once. And if you're not using pipelines, you're probably doing it wrong. All right. So um, now I want to go into a sample application sentiment analysis, which will also cover a little bit of uh, how to uh, work with text data. So maybe any questions about parameter selection or anything that I covered so far? All right. So let's do text data stuff. Wow. So I want to do um, sentiment analysis of, on IMDb movie reviews. So I have a bunch of uh, reviews from IMDb. They're like uh, raw strings like this. One of the worst movies I've ever rented. Sorry, I had one of my favorite actors on it, so on and so on. And um, 
each of these reviews has labeled as being positive or negative. So this is a negative review, as you can see. We have a training data set of 12,500 positive and 12,500 negative uh, reviews. So I told you, data for scikit-learn needs to be a numeric matrix, number of samples times number of features. Here we have these uh, raw texts, so they are quite different. So the first thing we need to do to do any machine learning on this, okay, so, th ah, maybe. so this is a classification task. We want to predict for a new uh, review, is it positive or negative? But we, before we can do this, we need to put it into a representation that we can work with. The way to do this is um, the so-called bag of word representation implemented in the count vectorizer. So this is like a standard, very simple NLP um, method. So let's say you have a, a string that you want to encode. Like this is how you get ants. The first step is you tokenize it, which is you split it up into words. So there's many ways to do this. Uh, the simple one that we use in scikit-learn is just to split it up into white space. And then you normalize it, making everything lowercase. And now we have sort of normalized words. You can try to do more elaborate stuff, like trying to get rid of the plural s or so uh, in ands, but let's keep with the simple stuff first. Then we built a vocabulary over all the documents in our corpus, so over all, a whole data set. So we go over all the reviews, tokenize all of the reviews, and look at all the words that, happen, that uh, appear in there. Then, to encode this uh, first sentence, this is how you get ants, um, we create a vector where for each word in the vocabulary, we count how often does this word appear in this, uh, in this string. So usually these vocabularies are like tens or hundreds of thousands of uh, words, because if you have larger data sets. Um, but the sentence has only six words, so there will be Six uh, entries, there will be one, because each of the words appear only one. So here, mo most of the words appear exactly zero times, and a bunch of words appear exactly once. So you have this large vector that is the size of your, tr uh, of your vocabulary. And so um, this allows us to have like a fixed numeric representation for all possible input strings. Because we don't want to store all these zeros, we use a sparse matrix representation that only stores the non-zero entries. All right. So then after that, so once we have this back of word representation, um, we can use a simple classifier. So here, um, if you run this and you're, if you want to run this at home and you're on Windows, you need to download something that can unpick, uh, unpack bzip2. Otherwise, but I, I did that already. So here I'm just loading this a whole bunch of text files having all the reviews. And there's a function load files in scikit-learn that helps me load the things. So here text train is now just a list of strings. So it's a very simple Python thing, just a list of strings. Y train is a NumPy array that contains zeros and ones for negative and positive labels. Here I count the length of the text train is 25,000, so I have 25,000 reviews, and uh, 12,500 are positive and negative. The people that prepared this data set, they already split it into a training and a test part. I load the test part, that's the same size. I can also look at these. So here this is the, I guess, second, um, second training point. Words can't describe how bad this movie is. I can't explain it by writing only, and so on. Um, you see this is like Unicode encoded, but I don't care that much. Um, and it has, it's labeled as zero, so this is a negative review, as you might expect. So now we can build, um, use the kind vectorizer to build the back of word representation. So here, this is a uh, transformer. It's a feature extraction method. Um, so I instantiated, I call fit with just the data, it's an unsupervised method. And now I count, it builds this vocabulary, which has about 75,000 words. So we extracted 75,000 words from this, from this whole training set. We can look at the words that were extracted here with get feature names. I plot the first 50, they are sorted alphabetically. The first 50 are just some numbers that appeared in the text apparently. Maybe not overly interesting, but if you like, Grab somewhere in the middle. You see a lot of the words in the vocabulary here, just like st stuff that starts with pins or pin. 
And so we have 75,000 words here. Um, basically, we have a large dictionary. Now we can use the transform method to transform the list of strings into a sparse matrix encoding. So X train here is now a sparse matrix. And you can see it has 25,000 rows and 75,000 columns. So one row for each uh, review and one column for each uh, feature. And each feature represents to the presence of a word. And here I picked out a very short one. So this movie is terrible, but it has some good effects. And if you look at this is the string, and here X train is the matrix encoding. You can look at the non-zero elements. And you can see that it has as many non-zero elements as uh, there are words here. And if you try, you can probably pick out the correspondences between the non-zero elements and the words. Uh, would you benefit from removing noise words like this is? You can remove stop words, and maybe you benefit. Depends on the application. Um, there's, you can do, I think there's stop words equal to English here, and it'll remove what it thinks are English stop words. Um, th there's several ways to do that. But. So, okay, we have the vocabulary. We transform our te uh, te test set two. So now we have a sparse matrix encoding for the training data and the text data, test data. And now we just are in the setting we were before. We can just build our uh, linear SVM model. So instantiated, fitted on a training set, scored on the training set, scored on the test set. Oh, it's different. So. You can see on the training set, we did it basically perfectly, 99.99% correct. On the test set, we're not so good. Um, well, 98, uh, sorry, 85% already. I mean, it's OK, but not as good as uh, perfect. I haven't talked about it so much today, but that's somewhat of a sign that we're overfitting. We're doing perfect on the training set. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I wrote this function here to plot the coefficients of the model. So. Um, the linear SVM is a linear model, so have, for each feature, how much this feature influences the result. And I picked out the 25 m most important negative and positive features, or coefficients. So here, these, uh, here's a plot with a lot of red bars. These red words are indicative, according to the model, of uh, a negative review. We have disappointment, waste, worst, poor, unfunny, and so on. These blue bars are indicative of a positive review, and we have scariest, refreshing, appreciative, and so on. There's also a lot of words in there that are kind of surprising, like squirrel. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a German. I can't pronounce this word, apparently. Um, no. And um, Brittany, crow, I don't know. Maybe they're expecting maybe. But that's kind of weird. This is maybe not the most indicative of a negative review. So this is, again, a sign that we might have overfit on a training set. We can kind of um, try to overcome this by building a more regularized model. So here I set the C value smaller, and we see um, we, we went up from 85% to 88% correct. Um, and we can visualize the coefficients again. And we see now they uh, make much more sense. So here, for the negative ones, um, they're all pretty negative. And the positive ones also make a lot of sense, like excellent, perfect, wonderful, great. And so maybe we think this is a better model. It's definitely more uh, what we expected. So obviously, I just did uh, the worst thing and uh, used the test set twice, so I shouldn't have done that. So what we actually should do is um, we should build a pipeline out of um, the feature extraction, the count vectorizer, and the support vector machine. and uh, then run a grid search over uh, the C for the support vector machine. And that's what I'm doing here. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, another five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes? OK. And uh, so I'll skip this, but if you want, like, there, you can also use n-grams and do plots using n-grams, and it's cool. And uh, do this at home if you're interested in text stuff. But I need the rest of the time to rant. So that's what I'm going to do. I call it scaling up, but it's actually just a rant. Um, so scikit-learn so is uh, mostly focused on data that fits into RAM. And uh, people always ask me, but what about Hadoop? 
And so this is my answer to this. So there's kind of three regimes of data that I think it's interesting to think about. Data that fits into RAM, data that fits into a single hard drive, and data that doesn't fit on a single PC. Um, so once you go down um, on these, things become harder. And sort of if data fits to RAM, you can do your IPython notebook, you can do your pandas and your scikit-learn, and everything is easy and very interactive. If it fits on the hard drive, you need to store and load your data. Maybe you do SQL stuff. It's not as nice. Uh, if it doesn't fit on, uh, fit on a single PC, you need to get some backend guy to set up a Spark cluster or waste a lot of time setting up your own Spark cluster. And I don't know. I don't like that. Um, but so, so for me, what are these regimes? So fits into RAM, uh, I'd say up to 256 gigabytes. Fits on a hard drive up to 6 terabytes. So who here does data analysis on more than 200 gigabyte of data? Ah, some people with big data. <laughs> Very good. I mean, but, so, um, but the rest of you, yeah, just get a big machine, and then you're always fine. There's uh, this very nice position paper. It's uh, four years old from researchers at Microsoft. Fortunately, it's still true. Nobody ever got fired for using Hadoop on a cluster. People set up Hadoop clusters to pr process like two gigabyte of data. I can do that on my laptop. Um, th people do it because Hadoop's cool and stuff. Don't be that guy. So really, so this is like from a non-disclosed cloud provider. Um, so 244 gigabyte of RAM are $3.12 an hour. That's pretty cheap. A lot like. That's a lot less money than it takes you to r write an online algorithm. Like, pay a data scientist to write an online algorithm. If you want six terabyte of uh, hard drive, it's 750 an hour. Still a lot cheaper than getting a backend engineer to set up your Spark cluster. Um, so I say 256 gigabyte ought to be enough for anybody. People over there might disagree, but I say for machine learning. So a lot of time you have a whole bunch of data but that's like some log files or some giant dump of JSON, then probably Spark is the right choice to kind of crunch it down. But once you go get down to, oh, now I want to learn a machine learning model, often you can get the interesting data down to 200 gigabytes. Maybe not if you're Google. Very few people here are Google. Is Google employees here? <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. So. Even if your data is too big, a very simple way to scale is just throw away the data. <laughs> and so if you have a lot of data, you should really think about, is it worth using this data to build a uh, model? You can subsample uh, the data very uh, strongly, and then add more data and see, does your model improve if, if you add more data? If your model doesn't improve to, if you add more data, well, you should probably get a more complex model. But that's sort of a different question. You don't need to go to a cluster if your model doesn't improve with more data. Another interesting case is, what if your data is very imbalanced? My favorite example for this is ad-click prediction. So a lot of people work in ad-click prediction. And in ad-click prediction, you have two classes. People click on ads, and people don't click on ads. But for some reason, nobody ever clicks on ads. Because why would you? And so the imbalance of the data is like 1,000 to 1, 10,000 to 1. People don't really t like to tell. Um, but so this means you have a lot of data, but only every 10,000th click, uh, every uh, 10,000th impression is a click. So, and only these really contain information. So if one of the classes is much, much larger, you can basically throw away all of this information. You can sample this by a factor of 100, 1,000, whatever. And you can still contain all the information, because all the interesting stuff is all in the few clicks that actually happened. So in this case, subsampling can be very efficient. Um, so, for, so most of the stuff in scikit-learn, as I said, is for data that's in RAM. There's also some th things that work uh, for uh, streaming data and for data that's on hard drive. And I want to briefly go over this. So basically, there's this uh, partial fit interface, which allows you to build the model incrementally. So in partial um, the idea is that usually if you call fit, um, scikit-learn will build a new model for you, and it'll forget everything else it ever uh, saw. 
So you can call fit on the iris data set, then you can call fit on ImageNet, and they're completely independent. With partial fit, the idea is that you incrementally improve um, a model by showing it more and more data. So you load some data into RAM, as much as you fit into, can fit into RAM, learn a bit the model, and you chuck the data out, load, uh, load another piece of data, and uh, uh, learn the model, check the data out, and so on. And this way you can learn from um, the hard drive or from the network. But you need to write your own like loop, loop over the data. And yeah, so let me briefly show this. This is the last thing I want to show. Um, so here I pretend my digital data set is really big. So I store it on the disk as like uh, 10 separate pickle files. Usually people have, maybe have their big data sort of CSV or HDF files or whatever. So you have some data files that are too big to load into RAM like all of the data. So each of the files should be chunked in a way so that each um, file is small enough to load into RAM, but all of it wouldn't fit. Um, then you get a second learn model that actually supports this partial fit. You instantiate it. And now you can loop over the data. Um, so here I read these files in sequence. I read the first file call partial fit, read a second file, call partial fit, and so on. Um, it works the same way as fit. For classification, you also have to tell it how many classes there are. Um, but otherwise, it's exactly the same. So now I iterated over all the data. And um, I left out the tenth bit, the tenth, and I can test on this and evaluate the model. So this way, you can learn with arbitrary large data sets. Give me a second. Um, so a lot of the models actually work incrementally. And it's not enough to um, run over the data set once. You should run over the data set multiple times, and it will give you better results. So if you do 4j in range 10, so here I pass over the data set 10 times, this will actually give me better results. Um, but So this allows you basically to work on streaming data and arbitrary large data. And yeah, the supported algorithms are SGD classifier, which are a lot of linear classifiers, naive base classifier, mini batch k means, PCA, dictionary learning. In the development branch, there's also a neural net. And a lot of the scalars support this. All right. So I'm not going to go through any of the rest. Ah, so if you want to hear me talking more, there's, apart from all the free stuff, there's also something you can pay for. There's the machine learning series, like seven hours. Uh, with O'Reilly, um, and there's also this forthcoming book that's going to be out in like two months or something like that. Um, and we'll ha have all the parameters you will need to grid search over. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, There. Hmm. Cool. Give me a second. Yeah, I should put this on the last slide, too. There are. If you go to my account or to this link, you'll find. Uh, all the slides and all the notebooks. Uh, there were two slight errors in the last um, notebook, but you didn't declare MB and, uh, and the other uh, notebook. Uh, but I run. NP. You didn't declare NP and the yeah, earlier. Yeah. All the notebooks run, I'm pretty sure. But we can talk to this about this offline. There's no already no. No, it's not averaging over. The SGD works by, by sample. It iterates over the samples in sequence. Yeah, there's a presentation on my web. Wait, I mean, obviously I can't. Can't give it to you now, but uh, way. Uh, 
Ha. Well, if you go to my, nah, ask me later. I can s give a link, give you a link. Yeah, so, yeah, th there's, so there's two things about deep learning stuff. A, you need d GPUs, and we don't want to support GPUs because it's a pain. And B, it currently moves very fast, and scikit-learn moves too slow for that. So there's like Keras, and Lasagna, and TensorFlow, and so there's a lot of really good libraries out there, so we leave it to them. We'll have a, there's SK Flow, yeah. Um, I probably would recommend Keras at the moment, but we are, there's a simple MLP. Hmm? Yeah. Um, there's a simple MLP, the development version, so there will be an MLP in version 018, but there was no GPU support, so. Yes. Keras is a scikit-learn compatible interface. Keras has a scikit-learn compatible interface, I was told. I haven't tried. And one last question, please. Uh, we will drop 2.6 in the next release. We will not drop 2.7 anytime soon. I recommend everybody ports to Python 3 and not use legacy Python anymore. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker. Thanks to the proposed team. One last thing you guys can do for us is help us stack the chairs on the way out. Good talk, man. Thanks. Thanks. So, that was cool. great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, so uh, in the last one where you had to take, I uh, removed the pound sign. Where will? Pile of mics. Which one does seven?